take advantage of the day. Okay. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Yeah. The playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Defending the Kingdom. And we're getting closer to real life uh, training camp football here. Uh, Mitch holds us with you, the voice of the Chiefs, along with the man, 10 year National Football League veteran, community leader. He's been great in our ambassador program. He is the shop, he's the barber shop, he's the Spider Man, Sean Barber. Sean, you and I have done these podcasts now for over a year, but since March, we've alluded to it. Uh, of this unusual circumstance that we're in with a worldwide pandemic and how it affects all of us, how it's affect the entire world. But now we're getting close for the Chiefs to try to start their run it back campaign to defend their world championship. And we have got a special defend the kingdom here because Rick Burkholter, vice president for sports performance and athletic training, we're going to turn it over to him in just a little bit, but he really gets into this uh, in depth. And Sean, I'm telling you, if people haven't watched any of our podcasts, and even if they're no football nerd, not a football nerd, they need to watch this one. In, in this time space, in this day and moment, the most important podcast is this one. Uh, Rick Bur- Burkholder does a great job of walking you through the spiritual, mental, physical aspects of this pandemic. He sees it from an employee standpoint, but he also walks you through how Coach Reed is seeing it, how the league is seeing it, how his employees how the family of the employees and the friends of the employees. So he's he's looking at this thing from a 360 degree model and letting everybody know how they can play a part in the solution. We all understand the problem. The pandemic is what it is. He talks about that 70-15-15 split later yeah. in the podcast. When you hear him talk about that, understand where you are on that split. Understand if you are part of the solution or part of the problem. And, and like you said, a few months ago, the, uh, the, the pandemic hit. And one of the things that some people did in the community was they started something new. They found a way to be a positive light uh, in a negative environment. So right now I'm wearing this uh, wear a mask shirt. You see that 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 beautiful Casey wear a mask, save the season, let's save football. That was done by a company here in town, Own KC Apparel. It's a guy who, it, to fight the pandemic, to fight some of the things, that, to be able to raise money for nonprofit organizations that were at this point, losing money because everybody was being tight with their wallets because of the pandemic. He right. found a way to give 100%, 100% of the profits back to local charities. And that's somebody, hey man, I take my hats off the guys that find a way in this in this culture, in this time uh, when everybody's going crazy, they want to wash their hands and wear them. Everybody wants to do everything they can to prevent themselves and their families to be safe. But sometimes what you have to do is do an act of faith. You got to understand that the process is greater than the product. And Rick Burkholzer and him and Andy Reid together has set the Kansas City Chiefs again above the rest. Mitch Reynolds has mentioned in this discussion, uh, he's been a hero. Uh, Kristen Krug, uh, the Chiefs uh, HR VP. John Tyrants, who's involved too, to provide a psychological, Mm -hmm. a mental um, approach emotional approach to this because this is we've seen this too shop a very much a part of it um, whether it's involved in individual families or in companies um, or in our culture and so the chiefs have done a remarkable job to this point they have become the prototype of the league the IDER the um, the infectious disease emergency response Rick's going to get into that in a second but I'm going to ask you two things here before we get into Rick's discussion one is the safety for players and players' families, coaches and coaches' families. You played this game, you've coached this game. The concern that players have, uh, and we've already seen players opt out, right, for, for a variety of reasons. Your thoughts as a former player and one who's been a coach a little bit on the players' concerns for safety. I mean, the concern is real. And it's not only a physical concern about your own health, it's a psychological, it's a mental. Like like when you go play, are you going to be able to totally focus and devote your mindset to football? Or are you still thinking about your aunt and uncle who somebody might have had it, um, a a visitor, somebody's coming into town to, to celebrate that you're a part of a championship team and that person has a little call for coal? What are you going to do with that person? They're going to stay at your house, where they're going to stay at? It, it, so it's a domino effect of the the, um, the the mental 
and the physical uh, strain that most of the players are going to have to deal with, just not just attending your team and saying, you know what, I'm all in. If I think about myself as a player, I would have to have a serious discussion with my wife and kids and let them know that uh, once daddy reports to camp, um, you might only see me via uh, Zoom or via voice call, video calls, pretty much for the duration of the season. Um, and that's how seriously I take my kids and my wife's health. I'm not saying that others don't, but that's the that's the call I would make. I, I would check myself into a long term hotel, uh, some so, some kind of facility where I can you know go to work, come back from work, be able to uh, have some comfort, some meals, and things like that. But I wouldn't be out. I wouldn't be out in the community. I wouldn't be out doing things. It would be a total from the day one of training camp until we run it back to back down in Tampa Bay. I would be committed to that season being a. I mean, this is a unique environment. Um, and I would dedicate myself to the team and do what has to be done to keep my family safe. Rick says a lot of fascinating things uh, in this interview. One of the things he talks about is we don't have a bubble. Yeah. They wanted to have a bubble in St. Joe that wasn't allowed. So he says we have a biosphere. The Chiefs have done, again, an amazing job in their setup, either at the practice facility or at Arrowhead in following the regulations, but then taking it to another staff. And now, again, they've become a prototype or an example for other pro teams and the NFL teams to follow. That being said, Rick will mention in this interview, our players leave the biosphere. Here's my next question to you. And let's do it in light of what we've seen in Major League Baseball in just the last 72 to 96 hours. The Miami Marlins supposedly some guys, a guy, a few guys, whatever, went out during their time in Atlanta when they were playing an exhibition game before the start of the season. Mm -hmm. They come into their clubhouse. Now, all of a sudden, we were approaching nearly 20 people testing positive in the Marlins organization alone. That now put a pause on them, but it affected the Orioles, the Phillies, the Yankees, who were to play them, the Nationals this week, the team close to you where you grew up, and it affected all those teams. Now, the, po the good thing is there's no positive tests in those teams as we do this podcast. But in this defending the kingdom, the first foe, we're calling it, and that is the foe here of COVID-19. Yeah. The responsibility of individual players here. You're in the biosphere. You said personally, if you talk to your wife and kids, I'm going to go maybe to an extended stay hotel and try to stay removed. We have now seen individuals, players, who do the opposite. Yeah. They want to be what they want to be. And all of a sudden now, the whole Miami Marlins deal has become an example for everybody else. As a player, former coach, former player, i got to ask you here about the responsibility individually and collectively of these guys, our guys, as they leave the biosphere. Andy Reid does a great job of making people realize when you're a part of this organization, um, it's, it's more of a family atmosphere. And so you, you come here, day one as a teammate, but the expectation is that you build something, a build a, a responsibility, a love, a, a, a accountability um, for one another where you see each other as family. And what I know about when we share family stories, I might be a player with no wife and no kids, and I might feel like it's my right to be able to go hang out, but I got to respect the fact that Tyron, uh, Pat, or uh, Kelsey, those guys might actually have aging family members staying with them. They might have a wife that has a previous condition. They might have just had a newborn kid, and so they don't want to expose that kid. And, and, and how terrible would I feel as a player if I exposed them to something because of my own negligence, that therefore let one of their family members... So if you, if you accept everybody as just an extension of your family, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's a lot easier to, to self-regulate uh, self your activities and be as cautious as possible making sure you're going down all the checklists, you know, washing your hands multiple times, watching what you touch, wearing your mask, um, keeping social distance. The things that we are asking the nation to do as a whole, this team has, has, has a protocol that Rick has put together to keep them as an entire uh, uh, Chiefs football organization as safe as possible. And not only our organization, but he's allowed them to share that with other teams and other uh, uh, um, um, other teammates from other teams they really cares about, hopefully the the the, the highest um, the highest protocol, the highest amount of responsibility is taken league wide, and our entire league sees themselves as family. On the on the field, they they they're foes, 
They're going to go battle when it's time to be Sunday. But from uh, from Saturday a- 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 until until you know until game time till kickoff, you got to take care of each other by taking care of yourself and doing what's right. Wear a mask, wash your hands, keep social distance. I mean, he lays it out here. It's really interesting. You and I are excited because we're getting closer yes, sir. to being at training camp. But the Miami Marlins thing was an alarming yeah. situation of like something like that, just really negligence or being dumb maybe can affect everything else. So for us as a country, us as leaders in our own families, this interview becomes one to listen to and take to heart. So now, ladies and gentlemen, Sean and I present to you the Vice President uh, for Sports Performance and Athletic Training, Rick Burkle. All right, Chiefs Kingdom. We are in unusual times, as everyone knows around the world, and we have been for five months. But this young man who's with me now, the world champion uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I want to get – who knew Rick Burkholter that when you got the title of Vice President for Sports Medicine and Performance last year, what it would mean – with the worldwide pandemic and relating to the National Football League. Just kind of give us a 30,000 foot view of what has happened with you in that role and the fact that you have had that now consolidation to help you with communication over these past five months. (laughs) Well, thanks, Mitch, and I'm not young, Um, but I am a world champion, so I'll I'll take that. Um, my, My day starts every morning by open it up the CDC website to see how many positive cases, how many deaths there were and where we're at in Kansas and Missouri every day. That's how my day starts. I never opened a CDC website in the last 10 years, right? Probably. Um, so right from jump street, it's changed. So this was a huge undertaking. It was, um, monumental for me because it took this whole organization and, when we won the Super Bowl, we were down 24, we were down 10, and we were down 10. Well, this pandemic has put the world down 28 to 3, mm-hmm. and now we're trying to make a comeback. And um, it's taken everybody. It's taken, it's taken my team that we've put together this infectious response team. Um, it's taken the coaches and the players buy-in, and, and we're not even – you know, the players aren't here yet, but I'm getting positive feedback from them. And so Coach Reed, I've been with him forever. He taught me by – he never said this, but I've watched him. He loves football, loves game planning, loves the pageantry, loves the strategy. You know, he told me one time, I could be happy coaching high school football because it's football, right? I've learned to love athletic training, and I do. But he taught me to love the players more. And my dad, who's been an athletic trainer for 60 years, has always told me, treat the person, don't treat the injury. That's how I treated this pandemic, is we've got to treat people. We've got to, we've got to make them safe. We've got to take their fears away. And I've interviewed a lot of players virtually to figure out what their fears were. I have a lot of African-American young men who have African-American aunts, uncles, fathers, grandparents that have gotten very sick from this pandemic. Mm. Something that I, honest to God, I can't relate to. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just not in that realm, but I see the numbers. And so I reached out to them and I said, what's your, what's your concerns? They said, our families, and then we'll feel guilty if we get it and have to miss time. And so, but that's what makes us champions, right? So my t- team put some things in place to ease that for them and I think they're happy with it we're going to educate the the families we're going to provide testing for families we're going to be able to get players away from their families if they're sick um and then you know we're one of the only teams in the league that has a full-time mental health clinician on staff full-time he's on my infectious response team because it's such a huge deal and you know when we get positive tests we're going to get positive tests Mitch it's it's going to happen um you just you hope it doesn't happen in, in big numbers. Sean will immediately be contacted and he will contact those employees. And, and even before we started, you know, there, there's people that loved ones of ours that have gotten COVID and people have reached out to me and I put Sean on them. So 
there's something to do with the with the protocol, right? This IDER that we put together, this infectious disease emergency response um, document, and that motivates us and that that guides us, right? That's the science, and I always talk about Andy Reid, the art and the science. He teaches us all about art and science. The art of this is what's driven me crazy because I've never had to do it. It's not in my it's not in my DNA. It's not in my blood. Um, I have some art when I'm treating injuries, but I'm chasing a I'm chasing something invisible right now and i've got to account for it it's like playing a video game and they're shooting you from behind you don't know where it's coming from that's me right now and that's been my life at thirty thousand feet thank god for my wife christine burkholder because she has steered the ship at home while i've been a mess absolute mess and I, I don't want anybody to feel bad for me this is my job i make a lot of money she told me the other night she woke me up in the middle of the night i don't even remember waking me up and she said i was screaming at the top of my lungs help me Help me. I have no idea. I, I don't know. It's just a stress involved. And here's a stress, and it's a beautiful stress. It's a beautiful stress. There's stress in this country. There's stress in this country. There's racial tension. There's political tension. People think that's stress, right? And it, and it is to some people. My stress is this, Mitch. I love the people that walk through the door of this place. And now in my title, I'm taking personal responsibility for them. Now, everybody's telling me it's not your, it's not only your responsibility. I get that. I have a whole team that's helping me. But if yeah. one of these guys gets sick or one of these coaches gets sick or you get sick, I'm going to go back and trace where I might have failed them. And I feel like I'm through the NFL, through the NFLPA, through all my great help here. I think, I don't really think we created a bubble because these guys can go home at night, but we've kind of created a biosphere. And I'm, I'm a little papa bear about this biosphere right now. I'm the guy running around the building saying, put a mask on. Don't let that guy go there. Use the hand sanitizer, you know. And it's not enjoyable, but it is to keep my loved ones, which are these players, these coaches, and the staff safe. And if we make it through, I told Christine this the other night. I said, babe, the, the single greatest moment in my career was winning the Super Bowl in Miami. And it was so good to me to be on the field and I, I'm getting goosebumps right now and see my girls and be able to hug Andy and all that because it took me so long to win it. I said, it's like having a child. So you have the first one and now you're pregnant with the second one. And you say, am I going to be able to love that second kid as much as I love the first? I think if we win it this year, and I do believe we're going to win it this year, this will be the sweetest moment of my life because there's been times in the last 12 weeks when I said, we ain't playing football in 2020. Yeah. And now to be here in campus right around the corner, you know me, you and I spend a lot of time in St. Joe. I love training camp. It's where I get to do my job. Somebody does my laundry. Somebody feeds me. Somebody makes my bed. All I have to do is do the thing I love. And the only thing I miss is my family. I love football. I love training camp and it's here. And I, mm, I had my doubts the last 12 weeks. So I'm, 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 I'm jacked up about this, but I want it to work. And I'm, I'm super cautious. I feel like I'm a lifeguard at the wave pool, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm counting on you. Let's jump back a couple things here and I'll let All you right. go. One is the IDER, the emergency response. Um, I'm sorry, the infectious disease emergency response document. It, you, the Chiefs were the first team. We were the first team to get it approved. Walk through the, the steps you had to do to get it approved because there was a lot of consternation. Players were coming out and giving a lot of opinions. And then all of a sudden it comes out, the Chiefs were approved. What did it take to get that approved, and how detailed was that process? So uh, I'll answer it in two parts. So the first part is you have to put together the document based off of the NFL protocols. So the NFL protocols will say social distancing in meetings, and if not, you have to go virtually. So then you have to take your individual setup and describe to them how you're going to socially distance in a meeting or how you're going to socially distance in your locker room. And you got to put it on paper to make it work for you. You've got to list all the sanitizing um, chemicals that you're using and how often you're going to do it and putting a uh, schedule together for it and, you know, how you're going to do your cafeteria and how you're going to do what PPE you have and all that kind of stuff. And so um, you put it all together and you can't do it by yourself. You got to put your name on it. That's what you get paid to do. But I had a whole team that did fabulous work, sent it to the NFL fully expecting for them to kick it back to me and say, okay, you're not in compliance here, you're not in compliance there. They kicked it back within 24 hours and said, we've approved you. It's going to 
they used to be called DICON. I can't remember what they're called now. They changed their name during the pandemic. Imagine that. But it's the Duke Infectious Control people, right? And they sent it back with one change. So I said, I said to my staff, I said, when we send this down to Duke or the NFL sends it to Duke, they're going to send us back with 20 changes, right? And then we're going to have to make some changes. Be ready. We've got one change. And the one change in our document was that we didn't have microfiber cloths. We had it listed as rags for cleaning. <laughs> so I was thrilled, right? Like, it, and, and I went around the building and I, I was almost in tears. Like, it's like, this is like winning a, a, a divisional game or, you know, like I'm getting there. Now it's got to go to the union. I go, there's no way. Like, I just know what the climate is right now. And they passed it through. And so I had a little mini celebration in the middle of this thing for about five minutes and said, <laughs> hey, we did it. Now we have a document. Now we can go to work. Because you don't want to, you want to order plexiglass and stuff for lockers, but you don't want to put it up if they're going to come back and say that's not going to work, right? So it was our getting approved that we could really put our action plan in place. Um, I love it. So the other side story too, which you, the, the kingdom will love and you'll love is, I, you know, Andy, Andy makes us very close to the players. And so I know that the Badger and, uh, and Pat are the leaders, right? I, I, it, that's obvious. I mean, all you got to do is show up in the first quarter of a game or pregame, you know that, and then being in the locker room with them. So I see that their buddy JJ Watts putting out on Twitter that nobody has an IDER approved. So I called the Badger. I said, look, man, I love J.J. I think he's great for the league, and I, I know what he's doing. But you call him right now and tell him the Chiefs have one. And he was like, what? And I said, okay, listen, before you do that, I'm going to send you mine. I'm going to send you mine. Mine's been approved. You have it. And then read through it and call me. And I said to Pat, I said, I'm going to send you mine if you got any of the boys that don't want it. So then the Badger called me, and he said, Rick, do you mind if I send this to Pat Peterson and J.J.? That made me feel good about the Chiefs, and it put those guys – they're leaders on the field, but I put them in a leadership role in the NFL. They're, they're like, this is what my organization's doing. Listen, we don't have the newest facility, but we have the one of the safest right now because of the people that work here, you know? And it is our home. Yeah. And it's Amazing. clean. Well, congratulations on that. It just makes me more proud of this franchise and, and everybody that's been involved with you. Now, just a couple more questions. One, Hey, let's be honest here. We're dealing with 22 to 28 to 29 year olds in the bulk of this team. You've got them in the biosphere, but they're not in the biosphere 24 seven. They leave. What do you tell these guys to say? Because we've seen it throughout in colleges. We've seen it, you know, they got to go to a party and 12 guys get infected or test positive, whatever. Yep. What are you telling them? What's coach telling them? And how do you guys say, hey, you're leaving our biosphere now. You're coming back in just a short while we got to have you, man. Don't, don't get crazy. What do you tell them? Well, previous to the pandemic, I believe that you control what you can control. Pandemic changed the world. <laughs> You've got to try to control the things you can't control. And yeah. the only way to do that, it's like raising daughters, right? You can tell them, don't hang out with those. You got to educate them. Got to educate them, educate them, educate them. And um, education is a big part of our IDER. Um, and I'm going to rely on – I rely on coach and his coordinators to make sure that the coaches are compliant. I make sure that, like, individual departments like Ted's and the cafeteria workers and Mitch and his staff and my staff and the equipment staff, we got young kids working for us. And we've got to tell them, if you, if you get anybody sick, you're going to – this is terrible. So um, you got to go home at night. And – I'll continue to educate through the process. I'll probably start in staff meetings, giving them a little nugget each day that they can kind of remind the players about. I will tell you this, Mitch. So I've tested every player in the organization now. Nobody was late. Nobody missed. Wow. It, it says it says almost everything right there. Finally. Some of, your, some of your boys beat me to testing this morning. I've been up there early because I've got to make sure it's up and running and all that. Yeah. But like Sherm and Schwartz and Winchester and Miko, they're in the parking lot, like getting ready for the parade. And I'm like, and they all had masks on. And I said, I said, what are you guys doing here so early? And they go, we want to get this thing rolling. Yeah. If you have that, you have a chance. Yeah. Love these guys as you do. And, it, and honestly, Rick, it's been separation anxiety because I'm not around them. And I don't think I'm going to be around them maybe all season long, but love those guys. And, You've in this podcast, which is 
basically, I'm going to call it, we're winning this first game. And the first game is this. Um, but finally, what would you tell the kingdom? Not from, for, and two things. One, if you're talking to the kingdom as if you're talking to our players, what would you tell them about the protocols? How do we handle this? The second, what would you tell them from a mental and emotional standpoint of how we're, you know, how we're going to win this first game? Yeah, that's a great question, Mitch. And, and unfortunately for society, we don't have a head coach. We don't have athletic trainers for society. We don't have the great doctors that we have from KU. And um, we don't have the great doctors like Monaco to tell the world. But first of all, it's a real, it's a real pandemic. It's a real disease. It's viral. So viruses are hard for us to contain, whether it's influenza or back in the HIV pandemic, um, or not pandemic, but it might have been an epidemic. There, there's very few pandemics, but this thing's real, and you can't see it. So we have to treat everybody like they're COVID positive. You have to. You have to go to the grocery store and assume the person that is checking you out is COVID positive. You can be safe. You can be safe. Keep a mask on. Wash your hands 20 seconds at a time with water and soap. Use hand sanitizer. Don't be with anybody more than 10 minutes because 10 minutes and six feet is the cutoff. And um, we, we can do this as a society. And this thing will, a lot of viruses die out on their own um, because they, they, viruses go because they can give it to each other and they mutate and all that kind of stuff. This can, this can be contained if we do the right thing. The problem is, Many people, and, and many people in the kingdom, and I'm a Twitter guy, and I'm a Facebook guy, don't get your news from there. Go, go to medical websites. Go to, you don't even have to be medical background. Go to the CDC. Go to places like that and find out information and do the right thing because you never know when you're going to be in a grocery store and you, you don't feel well, but you feel like you need groceries, and you go there and you run into Mitchell Schwartz. Yeah. Or you run into Anthony Sherman or you run into me, Cole Hardman, and then they can't play for two weeks, and it'll probably never get traced back to you, but you've got to do that. Now, mentally, it's okay to get the, the, the virus. Like, I've told these guys, it's okay to get the virus. What I struggle with is when you spread the virus because you do dumb things. I, I took a webinar, and somebody told me this on a webinar. 70% of the people in society will do the right thing. 15% will get infected even if they're doing the right thing. 15% of the people don't give a damn and they're infecting all everybody else. And so the number is going to continue to grow until that 15 that doesn't really care about it and doesn't care about society gets with the program and washes their hands and puts a mask on and all the stuff that we're asking you to do. It's real. We're going to try to keep it safe here, but it doesn't do us any good if you guys are sick in the kingdom. Yeah. We need you. We need you guys because that's been our that's been our bloodline through this organization. Well before I got here, you guys showed up whether they were winning or losing. Now we're winning. We want you guys to be able to come and enjoy it. And it's going to break my heart on September the tenth if there's not a full stadium and we're raising that banner for the first time. That's going to kill me. But I know my group on the sideline. I hope they're going to be safe. I'm praying that they're going to be safe. And I'm going to do everything I can to keep them safe. I ask the kingdom to do the same. Pray that you're safe, do everything you can to be safe, and maybe by the end of the year when we're really hitting our stride, you guys will be able to be back in the stadium full, and, and we'll do this thing. And, Rick, when we drop that banner, whether it's some fans, no fans, all fans, you're going to feel that spirit, and they're going to feel the spirit of this podcast coming back because it's something I say every day, Rick. This organization is at a whole completely different level uh, and leading – for not just the NFL, but the rest of the professional leagues. But you will feel that spirit because it's very real. Thanks for being with us, my friend. Let's run it back, and God bless you. And just hang in there, buddy. Keep keep <laughs> grinding away for us. We're counting on you. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. And know this, when Fauci makes us wear rubber gloves, I'm putting that big old ring right over the rubber gloves. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I'm, I'll do the same. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Love you. Ten, five, touchdown! Lock it down! The celebration begins at Arrowhead.